Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, welcome to this, uh, our sixth workshop and our 10th event in the Canadian Historical Association's virtual workshop and roundtable series for 2022-23. Thank you all very, very much for joining us today for this uh, important discussion. Uh, my name is Dave Hazan. I am a graduate student at York University's Department of History and one of the CHA's two organizers in charge of moderating this series. Uh, it is my very distinct pleasure today to uh, introduce our speaker, Gwyneth Jones, all the way from Coast Salish Territory in Vancouver. Welcome, Gwyneth. Um, we will begin with a land acknowledgement. I'm here in Toronto, uh, not far from York University's Kiel campus, so I will use York's standard land acknowledgement. Uh, but for those of you in other parts of the continent, I invite you to reflect on the land you are situated in. So York University recognizes that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. Uh, York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many uh, First Nations, Inuit, and uh, Métis communities. We acknowledge the current tree holders, the Mississauga of the uh, Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Gwyneth Jones has been engaged in managing and conducting research for litigation and dispute resolution processes for over 35 years. Uh, for governments, First Nations, and Métis clients. She has testified as an expert in nine trials and has reviewed reports and prepared research materials on dozens of issues related to Indigenous uh, rights and claims. Her evidence was described as crucial by uh, triers of fact in such leading cases as Powley 2003 and Daniels 2013. She is grateful to be speaking to you today as a settler on unceded Coast Salish territory. Gwyneth, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here speaking to you all this morning. Good morning, everybody. It's still morning on the West Coast. It's gonna be morning for a long time, actually, on the West Coast. Uh, this presentation is going to be, uh, I guess uh, there will be a, a little bit of, uh, philosophical musing, but not very much. What I'm really trying to do here is to pass on some practical tips and reminders to people who have to do this kind of work or who have offered to do this kind of work uh, about your role in the courtroom and some points that will make your reports more useful and more compelling in this particular context. We're gonna be going over the court rules and the role of an expert and some ideas on how you can structure the project when you're talking with your clients for the first time and multiple times after that about the project and how it's going. And then what litigators find helpful in terms of a product and also a little bit about client management, how to how to manage your role in this process and your relationships with your clients. Uh, there are court rules regarding experts and the role of the experts. Um, before the, about the mid 1990s, there were not really, there was some case law, but there were not really a lot of rules regarding expert evidence. These rules do vary somewhat from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but the basic elements are the same. The, the rules were developed really in all the jurisdictions to discourage the practice of, of having experts that were aligned only with one type of party in a litigation who were essentially hired to produce reports that would be the most favorable to that party. And this is particularly notable, say, in insurance defense and medical malpractice type of cases. 
the commercial damages cases, there were experts who could be called on reliably to provide the largest possible number or the most favorable possible assessment of uh, damage or loss or liability. And there would be other experts who would be known, say, to minimize all the claims. Now, I, this, of course, still does go on, but these rules are intended to remind people of what their role in the courtroom really is. And of, of course, they do apply to all experts, um, no matter what the field is that they're testifying in. So I thought maybe we could just take a quick look at these federal court rules. Now, these are the federal court rules. Um, as I say, they do vary a little bit from one jurisdiction to the other, but this, they all have a similar flavor. <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> the first paragraph here is probably the most important, which is probably also why it's first. An expert witness named to provide a report for use as evidence or to testify in a proceeding has an overriding duty to assist the court impartially on matters relevant to his or her expertise. And that this duty overrides any duty to be a party to the proceeding including the person retaining the expert witness. An expert is to be independent and objective and not an advocate for any party. <clears throat> so that this is the key thing to remember if you are approached to be retained as an expert. Uh, unfortunately for your clients, they are paying the bill, but as soon as you are hired, essentially, you are outside their control. They can decide to discontinue the work or not to file the report, and that does happen fairly often, but they really can't tell you what to say or how to do your work within the reasonable time and budgetary limits, of course, but um, it's, uh, although you are hired to be an, an expert by them, uh, the, your first responsibility is to assist the court, uh, the court in this case, meaning especially the judge, but really it's a, it's a reference to the whole process of trying to get the best possible information before uh, triers of fact, as they call them. So to produce the best, the most fair uh, and uh, legally defensible outcome. <clears throat> and I, I just want to say a word here about clients. Essentially, you're going to have two clients. You're going to have the client whose case is before the court, and then you're going to have your legal team. Now, it's, it's probably going to be the, the original client who's hired the lawyers who is going to be paying you, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the lawyers will offer to pay the bills up front and then they will recover from the original client. But uh, most of your contact and most of your work is going to be with the legal team. But you can meet with the original client, uh, especially the legal team may want to keep their client informed on how the litigation is going and the kind of people that are working for them. But the legal team is going to be the client that's going to understand better what your role is going to be and how to instruct you and what the appropriate relationship is in this setting. Uh, you should not be seen as advising the original client on strategy or the strength of their claim. So you can, you know, you can certainly meet with them. You can listen to what they have to say which can be very important uh, and, um, you know, be, be open to what they have to say, but you are not their advisor. There really has to be an arm's length relationship between you and your clients, uh, both the legal team and the original client. Um, but, and, and this, I might say, can put some experts in, a, in quite a difficult position because 
uh, you know, many experts are hired because they know a great deal about this client's particular set of issues, or they understand their clients well. Uh, this is particularly the case, for example, um, anthropologists have, have these issues in court quite often. Um, th there's no person maybe who would better understand the client and their history and their views, their situation. But sometimes if the relationship has been very close, there is a suspicion by the other parties, possibly by the, the court officials themselves, that the expert has been captured, we could say, by that client, and that their opinion is not truly impartial. And it, it, it's a little bit less of an issue, generally speaking, for historians, but it can be, if uh, depending on the kind of work you're doing. Uh, and it is, it is something uh, that some experts are going to have to, to face. So it's just a, something to keep in mind about your relationship. Um, sometimes you are going to be feeling like you're spending a lot of time with the legal team. And, you know, you might as well cultivate a really good relationship with them because you are going to be spending a lot of time with them. And uh, it's, it's nice to be able to build on a positive relationship, but you're really not part of the team. And it's important for you to bear that in mind and to keep that, keep that in front of you as, as you're working. Your job is not to be part of your client's legal team or their, their advocacy. Uh, there's some, more um, in these federal rules about exactly what should be in experts' reports. Um, <clears throat> and if you just look down the list of bullets here, some of them are pretty uh, straightforward. Um, the curriculum vitae has to be attached, for example. But then you get to paragraph D, the facts and assumptions on which the opinions in the report are based. Um, and, you know, often I think historians don't really get a set of facts and assumptions. This is something that applies much more to other fields. For example, in commercial litigation, uh, an expert may be given a set of facts about the way a company operates, or whether or not um, say a transaction was supposed to go through or, or not. Uh, and they have to state up front what assumptions they have been given. And then it's up to the lawyers to prove that those facts and assumptions are true. Really as historians, we're not usually given any facts and assumptions and, and <laughs> we should probably resist it if we are. And uh, again, it's something that you might have to help the court or your clients understand is exactly how your work is going to fit into these, this box that the federal court rules, for example, have created for you. Um, the, this, these are really developed for a report where there is uh, a set of facts set out at the beginning. There's maybe some calculations or some medical tests or something like that, which are described in the middle. And then there are conclusions at the end. A narrative historical report might not really fit into all of these boxes. Uh, you can say, for example, the, the reasons for each opinion expressed. Well, again, the opinion, and we'll get into more of this later, is often uh, the narrative itself. So the reasons for each opinion is, is going to be really tied up in your entire report that uh, the way it hangs together and is supported by evidence 
um, as a as a narrative, whether it's coherent and uh, whether the inferences that you draw from the material that you're working with uh, are are supportable, are um, are reasonable. The literature and material specifically relied on, that's a little easier, that's going to be in your footnotes and in your bibliography if you do one. So that's that's not too difficult to figure out. And then the in number, the last bullet there, the summary of the methodology used, including any examinations, tests, or other investigations. Again, this is really designed more for uh, scientific or um, even financial evidence. But you can describe what your methodology is in, in your instructions. You can explain where you went to do research. Uh, if you're using a database methodology, of course, this is the time to explain how that works. Um, now this is an interesting one on the next page, number J, any caveats or qualifications necessary to render the report complete and accurate, including those relating to any insufficiency of data or research. Now, I think all of us as historians feel that our sources, whatever they are, always tell an incomplete story. So, uh, you know, particularly in cases where the party in the litigation is, say, a marginalized party or is not represented in your records. I do a lot of things related to Indigenous issues, so this is an issue that is front and center. The insufficiency of data or research in my case would be that Indigenous peoples are not directly represented in most of the materials that I use. Occasionally there is some uh, statement, but again, it is often filtered through the lens of another observer. So this is, uh, this is an important time to, to look at this particular paragraph. And al again, although it was developed for a more scientific or uh, commercial type of report. It certainly does apply to historical reports. Um, and then the, the last bullet there, number K, particulars of any aspect of the relationships with a party to the proceedings that might affect his or her duty to the court. This does not usually come up, but it, it, again, it's more directed towards people say who might be interpreted to have some kind of financial relationship. But uh, the remarks that I had made earlier about say a longstanding relationship based on uh, research or advocacy, um, there, it's, it's good to be transparent about that up front and uh, rather than leaving it to be uh, the subject of questions later. <clears throat> now, the last section here is about expert conferences. In the current rules in many jurisdictions, there is, a, I hope expressed, I guess you can put it that way, that experts will meet before the trial starts to reduce the number of issues on which there may be disagreement so that by the time you get to the trial, there is actually an agreed body of facts and a clear statement of where the experts disagree. But I have to say that in my experience, um, legal counsel, can be quite uncomfortable with the idea of having all of the experts in a room together, essentially deciding <laughs> the key facts of the case. 
So I have not myself participated in any of these expert conferences, but I do know other people who have done it. And uh, the feedback I get is generally that it it's, is fairly collegial. There may be a little bit of wariness at first, but that essentially when you get people who have the same kind of experiences and knowledge in a room that there is, uh, there can be collegiality. And again, you are not the advocate in this situation. Um, these conferences are really designed to focus on evidence. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about how to define your expertise. Um, I've already talked about how these rules are not designed for historical narrative reports. I do sometimes do a format of opinion page, which just briefly describes how each of the requirements that you've just seen uh, it is met in my report. For example, that the sources on which I've relied are the footnotes, the opinion is the narrative, uh, the, the conclusions uh, will be in an executive summary or in summary paragraphs at the end of each section, that kind of thing, just to make it perfectly clear that your report meets all the rules. Uh, we are gonna talk a little bit more about how to define your expertise. Now, I'm just gonna take a quick look at the form that you're going to be asked to sign acknowledging your duty as set out in the rules which council will provide you with. So there's the, uh, the form. Now this is a different one. This is the one used at the Supreme Court of Ontario. But again, they're all very similar. And uh, it's just to make it clear who's, who's my client. I've been engaged on behalf of whoever it is and that you acknowledge your duty to provide opinion evidence that is fair, objective, and nonpartisan, that it's related only to matters that are within my area of expertise, and that I will provide such additional assistance to the court as may be reasonably required. And this is usually your testimony. And then you acknowledge that this duty prevails over any obligation which you may owe to any other party or the people on whose behalf you're engaged. <laughs> now let's talk a little bit about expert opinion. What is, it, what is an expert opinion? Um, you're not being asked to decide the case, interpret the law, make an argument even if the question before the court is a historical one. And the kinds of questions you're being asked seem to be, you know, who wins here? Is, is, uh, is there, did these events happen? Um, your report is not going to be the only thing that is happening in that courtroom. There's going to be many other people in the courtroom. There's going to be other experts, there's going to be counsel, and there's especially going to be the judge. So you really have to make space in your own report for all of these viewpoints and all of these other people. Uh, the, um, it is certainly true that, you know, if you express um, anything that might infringe on legal opinion or interpretation, or maybe trespasses on the role or the expertise of those other people in the courtroom, that the report is, some parts of it may be excluded, and the weight that it is given in the final judgment may be significantly reduced. So it is important to, as they say, stay in your lane and be careful only to offer an opinion on, uh, on, area, on things within your area of expertise. And it's important to discuss upfront with your potential clients what your expertise really is. 
if they really need to be hiring a loss of use expert or evaluator or an anthropologist or a demographer or whatever they really need, you know, these are things as a historian that you might be able to do, but also, I mean, bear in mind, there are people whose expertise is 100% those things. So you may be able to provide historical evidence respecting some of those issues, but you may not really be qualified to offer an expert opinion in court on some of those issues. So the, when you're discussing this with potential clients, you, sh you should be transparent about what your expertise is and not promise too much. Uh, they should know if they need to hire other experts um, so that they can develop their litigation strategy. Um, this is uh, the probably what you're going to be doing as a historian is um, providing evidence or helping people assess evidence, which is more accurate about what happened, say, you, you know, you are a, a fact witness. Um, my role is often just to set out the narrative of the, say, the events that might have led up to this claim. There are other people, of course, who are specialists, for example, in culture groups or uh, in more specific areas of uh, historical work, which may be relevant to the case at hand. Um, but I, I'm often just setting out a, a narrative with which everybody can work. And really, I think for most historians, there is, there is always going to be a little bit of that task is just to help people understand what the events are and what kind of documentation or other evidence there is that speaks to it. Again, this is um, taking a little bit of looking ahead a little bit, but you will be need to go through a formal qualification process when you're in the courtroom and opposing counsel can cross examine you to determine whether your expertise really applies to the specific issue. So again, when even at the very first stage, when you're first talking to a potential client, again, make sure that your qualifications uh, match the report that you want to submit and your own particular skills and experience. It all begins to kind of come together as a, a package. Um, you are, as a historian, probably a subject matter expert. There's something that you've specialized in, but qualifications also include skills. Uh, for example, I have been qualified as someone who is an expert in the interpretation of historical documents. Uh, others of you may be experts in the collection and analysis of oral evidence or demographic or statistical analysis. And it's important to include those in your court qualification because it will uh, get you out of having objections made every time you speak to something that's outside of your very narrow subject matter expertise. Um, as historians, we're, handled, we're equipped to handle evidence and data and uh, it's more than about the subject area. Um, it, is, it is about your skills as a historian and the way that you handle uh, the kind of evidence that you're using. That's, that's really what you're contributing to the process. So it is unusual for an expert to be totally disqualified at the qualification stage, um, but the judge may give your evidence less weight if your experience and your expertise doesn't really seem directly applicable. And then after you've decided what your expertise is, you really have to stay in your lane. This is the comment you'll hear again and again. Um, don't um, comment on 
things on which you are not really qualified as an expert. So again, what is an expert opinion? There is a Supreme Court of Canada case which speaks to this, R versus Mohan, and it is a, a case of um, medical negligence, essentially. So some of the aspects of it aren't directly applicable, but they, much of it is, and it's all considered to be applicable. The four pillars of what gives someone the privilege of being able to appear in a courtroom as an expert are whether your evidence is going to be relevant, which is something which is decided by the judge, whether it's necessary to decide the case, uh, whether it's not excluded by another rule, and whether you are properly qualified. Um, there is, as you know, in court, in court, there is a strong bias against or a requirement to exclude, in some cases, things that are considered to be secondhand or hearsay evidence. But there is uh, an exception made for experts to talk about something within their field of expertise. Um, and that means that they must be talking about something that's outside the experience and knowledge of a judge or jury. So you know something or you have some set of skills that an ordinary, if highly educated person doesn't have. And the, the part of the decision goes on to say that experts must not be per permitted to usurp the roles of a trier of fact, causing a trial to degenerate to a contest of experts, which is really where most of these rules came from. You must have acquired special or peculiar knowledge through study or experience of the matter. And again, this applies more to the kind of medical evidence uh, this case was about. But if you advance a novel scientific theory or technique, it will be exposed to special scrutiny. Uh, this, this is the case, I would say, still as a historian, if you put forward a, you know, a highly theoretical argument about something, um, which is not perhaps so obviously tied to the kind of evidence that the court will be looking at. Your, that theoretical argument, if it's the underpinning of your report, will probably come under some fairly close examination. So again, what do you have that a judge or a lawyer, or I've never done a jury trial because most of my cases affect people's rights. So those kinds of cases don't generally go to jury trials, but what do you have that they don't? Well, you have the skill in locating available evidence, um, not just what supports the particular interpretation or argument, but the evidence that might be relevant to the issue in court. And you can present it in an understandable way, which should not be underestimated. Uh, we have lots of knowledge, back knowledge, they would call it. Uh, you know, say, about rare fish or uh, about 19th century industrial development. Or, you know, these are things that not everybody would have the same depth of knowledge about. But really, I think our most important skill is that we provide with our professional training, the tools and expertise to assist counsel and the judge to weigh the evidence that is before the courtroom. Um, I, you know, when I was first asked a lot of these types of questions by lawyers, I had to hesitate before answering them because it was just a slightly different way than I was used to thinking about uh, for example, the kind of voices that come through in historical records. 
but they were almost looking at these perspectives, these voices, like you would ask people about a traffic accident. <laughs> you know, well, is this person reliable? Uh, well, these two people disagree, so one of them must be wrong, or we have to discard this one, or, well, this is contradictory, so we can't use it. And I think as historians, we're much more comfortable with evidence that looks like this. Um, and we can decide, or we can help lawyers understand why one source is more reliable to the other about a specific event or an issue. Well, you know, these people had a much closer relationship with the people involved in the in the event. Uh, these people had strongly preconceived views which might have affected their ideas about the event. Um, these two people or these several people disagree on what happened because of the particular context in which they're making the remarks. Uh, there, and there is a way of making all of the perspectives and the evidence uh, you come together in a narrative. Uh, it's particularly important, for example, if there is oral and written evidence. This is something that I come across. Um, and even more so if you know that there are going to be people giving firsthand oral evidence in the courtroom, you don't want your documentary evidence, say, to override them in any way or to make it seem like there's a problem if those sources don't completely agree. Uh, we can help people understand evidence in its appropriate context. You know, uh, I mean, lawyers and judges are usually really good at reading. That's what's got them there in the first place. And they think they can read as well as you. <laughs> they think they can listen to oral testimony as well as you can. And, you know, I find sometimes historians have to kind of defend their expertise and explain what it is that gives them the right to draw certain conclusions or to treat evidence in a certain way. Um, accountants rarely have to defend their expertise because many lawyers don't really understand how numbers work. But uh, historians are doing something that lawyers and judges do every day. So I, this, is, this is something, and I, I've had this feedback from counsel over the years that they really, by the end of it, they came to understand what it is that historians do. And for example, why you can't just cherry pick the best statement in the whole pile of documents that's particularly helpful. And this is the job of the lawyers. They are advocates. If they find a really good statement, they're going to want to run with it. But you may have to explain to them why that particular smoking gun quotation is not quite what it seems, or, or maybe it is. I mean, maybe there is a statement there that is really important and that they should understand why that is. And that is definitely the job of a historian. That is, that is absolutely what you're doing there. You know, you do understand all this context and perspective and how to assess, or as they would say, weigh historical evidence. And that's where you're gonna add value. So I guess the way I look at it is that historians are really gonna be defending their boundaries from both sides. You have to describe why you're an expert and why your opinion should be given substantial weight and also be really transparent about what you don't know, where you're not qualified to give an opinion where your evidence does not speak in a definitive way to the issue before the court. It's really important. Um, and believe it or not, judges love to hear the words, I don't know, or I am not going to express an opinion on that from an expert. It, it really raises your credibility if they see that experts understand what their limitations are. And they don't, I mean, don't let the fact that they're calling you an expert 
make you think you have to be omniscient. That is absolutely not the case. So now we're going to get into some nuts and bolts. You're going to be given an instruction letter, or you should be. Uh, and what's going to be in it? There are going to be questions that you have to answer. Uh, here's some do's and don'ts about questions, at least from my experience. Um, don't answer questions that contain assumptions that can only produce one answer, or questions that limit your work to exclude evidence that is central to the issues. Now, there's a, there's a caveat to that. It's in as much as possible that lawyers are gonna to want to eliminate overlap between expert reports to reduce the risk that experts will contradict each other. So that may limit your terms of reference. Um, and you may know that there are other important parts of the story, but those important parts of the story may be covered by other witnesses. Uh, and, you know, again, it's particularly true if people are going to be giving oral testimony. Um, they, they will have much more credibility because they are the first-hand witnesses. And if there are uh, people with a particular skill or uh, area of expertise, they may be giving their evidence about um, those key issues. So you will not be you will not be writing the complete history of the event probably when you are asked to do this kind of work. But you can also avoid, I think, projects that are so narrowly defined that you know that <laughs> they have been defined in a way that, that deliberately does not look at the most important part of the, the event or the object or the, the issue that's before the court. Uh, and again, you can advise your client on that. You know, you can't really talk about X without talking about Y. But on the other hand, I would say don't um, digress too much. Once you get your questions, um, answer the questions asked, um, as long as they're open-ended and as long as they're reasonable. Again, you're, you don't have to write the complete history of the event for this particular purpose. Um, I would say don't get too far away into areas and say theoretical discussions that don't really address the specific issue in the litigation. You'll have enough to do in um, answering for your own report and it may distract, distract from the material that it's really important for you to present and possibly undermine your evidence. Um, and it's my experience anyway that judges and counsel are really not interested in those kinds of discussions and everybody has enough to read. So the, uh, the kinds of questions that you're looking for will be the ones that, uh, that focus on the historical evidence, that ask you to review, assess, present historical evidence relating to the issue rather than answering the question that is at issue in the courtroom, you're gonna to wanna to focus on the parameters of the research. What are you gonna be expected to do? What's the time period? What kind of sources and methodology you're gonna use? Uh, what geographic area are you gonna cover? What's the population you're gonna look at? What's the activity? Again, you don't want to particularly, I, you know, I've done a number of cases about uh, historic populations, and you don't want to prejudge the answer in the question, but those, these are the kinds of uh, fence posts that you're going to want to put around a report, <clears throat> and also exactly what the products are going to be. Some, in some cases, you're going to be doing an original report. In some cases, you're going to be assessing someone else's report, maybe doing a reply report, they call it. Uh, you, you will probably be expected to produce a document collection. So just clarify exactly what it is they're going to expect at the end. Now there's a, another practical thing in here about file management. 
remember as you get going on a project that the other parties in the litigation have the right to request your working files um, after your counsel files your report and gives the notice that they intend to rely on it. So the opposing counsel are going to be very interested in any statements you may have made about the validity of the arguments or any instances in which you may have changed your opinion or in fact, if, if you've ever been advised to change things in your opinion, which means the report. So be uh, measured, be neutral in your written communications. Screen sharing is a good thing. Uh, calls rather than a lot of written comments are a good thing, but you know, be open about this. You have to retain all the things that were shared with council, uh, report draft, emails, notes, file lists, uh, anything that you just, if you have notes that you discussed certain issues with your colleagues and they gave you some good tips, uh, you know, that all of this should be in your file. Um, now, the, the technical requirement is that you turn over all the contents of the file relating to the preparation of the opinion. And this is still developing. Your uh, counsel will probably help you with your file to tell you what's what to, is producible. Um, you may be asked what your usual practice is regarding work like this. Do you have a series of drafts? Do you just do one rolling draft? Do you do a content outline? Do you typically make a lot of notes from telephone calls? And, and I have to say about all this too, that um, you may have to <laughs> stand your ground a little bit sometimes about this because in my experience, it seems like some lawyers don't really seem to think that this is a real thing and that the requirement is there, but it never happens. And I mean, I'm here to tell you it happens. I have testified nine times and three times my file has been requested and I have been cross-examined on that file. Um, you may have to speak with your counsel from time to time and remind them to temper and to limit their written communications with you because it's you that's going to have to be accountable for everything in that file and is going to have to explain every comment they made to you uh, whether you responded to it whether you didn't why you didn't and uh, it's it is very distracting from the work that you want to present it's uh, really, if you say, oh, I just ignored them. I thought it was rubbish. Or you said, yes, I did take their advice. It, it just doesn't look very good either way. So, so be careful about written communication and, and make sure that you always project your neutrality, that, that you are in fact a neutral expert. You're also going to be protected expected to produce a copy of every document to which you refer in the footnote, including secondary sources. This seems to come as a surprise to a lot of people, but this is the standard practice uh, and it takes a long time. Um, it can take at least two or three weeks after the report is done to pull together all of the documents, describe them properly, which is a big part of your expertise. Um, I have tried to work with so many databases where, you know, orders and counsel are described as letters or, uh, you know, the, the people who are putting together the database have no idea who the people are who are writing the letter and to whom it was directed and how to date it correctly and how to keep all the attachments together and where it came from. I mean, all these things are really important to the significance of a document. And it's it often unfortunately gets outsourced to people who don't really know as much as you do about historical documents. And, or who have not seen the document in its original archival context. 
which can also tell you a lot about documents. So this is something which I no longer outsource. I think it's really important for me to do it. And uh, it does, it, it is a big part of historical expertise. Your report is probably gonna be quite footnote heavy because almost every statement you make, someone is gonna have a question about it. Where did you get that? Why did you think this? Why did you pick this passage and not another one? And people are really gonna be reviewing all of this in great detail. So be prepared for that. Uh, the footnote like this one is probably <laughs> not, um, not what you want in a litigation report, probably not in any kind of a report. Um, <clears throat> now, just uh, about the style of the reports. These reports, the style can be a little bit different to be useful. There is so much time spent in legal analysis in parsing the exact wording of documents. And every time you paraphrase, you run the risk of imposing another meaning on the document. And in fact, there will be questions that, well, you know, you said that this letter says this, but in fact, the exact wording is a little bit different. And, and so it's really, it's more useful and uh, a little bit less exhausting just to use quotes heavily. Um, actually put the extract of the documents, especially if there are key documents or legal instruments so that people can see the extract right there in front of them, have the exact wording, um, parse their heads off and just have it conveniently right in front of the, right in front of them in the report. It will also, it, it makes your report more useful. And it also, of course, um, if they're using your report all the time, it, it will, I suppose, help the report's uh, credibility if it's really a useful document that they turn to all the time. Sometimes clients will ask for transcripts of documents. And unfortunately, I'm sure we, most of us can attest to this now, it means that anything that's handwritten um, because people are losing the skill of reading handwriting and I, usually try to get out of making transcripts because it's really time consuming. So if you put the key text in the report, then people will use, use that instead. And legal users love structure, chapter breaks, subheadings, executive summary, summary paragraphs, summarize things all the time. Um, but do be careful that the summaries match each other and that they match the content. Um, your introduction can uh, give the setting as to how you're retained, when, by whom, terms of reference. Uh, you'll often be attaching your uh, retainer letter to the report, but the terms of reference up front are very helpful. An outline of the structure of the report. <laughs> uh, the methodology, which includes all the, the original research you did, the documents that were given to you, uh, say interviews, if, they were, if you did interviews, if you have more than one person working on a report, how the work is divided up, and also anything you want to say in general about the sources and terminology. This is um, how I <laughs> sometimes feel <laughs> that, um, you know, what, you can't read five pages without having a summary or a chapter heading, but anyway, it just makes reports more useful if they're broken up into little pieces. Now, a little bit about the research. Do your own work. Um, don't plagiarize. Well, yeah, that should be obvious, uh, but it, it has happened, actually. Um, the report couldn't be filed because it was found to be plagiarized. Not mine, I hasten to say, but... I also won't tell you who it was. And don't get someone else to do most of the research. And then even if you write it, put your name on it, it really has to be the person who does the work, who testifies to it. Um, obviously you have to make some exceptions if you're running a large project, 
but you have to be really involved and really understand the methodology and the sources. Again, this is about you personally being an expert on this material. Uh, that's uh, a reason, by the way, why a lot of expert witness work is done by sole practitioners. It's very hard to leverage it out. Consulting firms find that it's difficult to make a lot of money on expert work. It's, uh, you know, having said that, the scale of research has really increased over the last three decades. Reports used to be 30, 40, 50 pages. Now they're hundreds of pages. Um, there are document collections, which are thousands of documents. Uh, we have new historical database methodologies, which require a lot of data entry and uh, analysis of material that you clearly one person cannot do. So the trick is just to manage the work so that the person who's testifying really does have an intimate knowledge of the material and the methodology. And uh, don't accept engagements where the client supplies most or all of the documents and just needs a report. I, you know, every time people say, oh, we've collected all these documents, you know, we, we've got tons of stuff. And I have to explain to them that I still need to go back and do my own work, to go back to the archival files, to see the documents in context, um, to add to the research as I see fit might save me some money in, in reproduction costs if they've already collected things, but I really have to go back and do all the work myself to understand the evidence. Again, we're talking about, about historical work as evidence in this case. And also for litigation work, don't spend too much time on secondary sources because they don't really have a lot of weight unless your task is to do a literature review of some kind. Um, the judges probably don't have any idea who you're quoting or what their authority is. And the authors are not in the courtroom and you are in the courtroom. So again, your task is going to be to present an opinion founded on historical evidence. Um, you can, for example, I, you know, I obviously I've done cases where it has to be mentioned that Confederation of British North American Colonies happened in 1867. <laughs> so for uh, the, is the court cases where that is not part of the issue at stake, really. It's, a, it's an incidental, not incidental, but it is uh, something that happened, but which is not the focus of the litigation. I will throw in some secondary sources in the footnotes just to say, here's the, here's the background. You know, this is, this is what happened. Uh, th these, this is a summary description of what happened. But then I've also done court cases where <clears throat> the circumstances of confederation have been the central issue in the litigation. And for that, I go back to all the primary sources. So again, it, it depends uh, what, your, what your task is. Um, now revisions. The legal team are gonna have comments. Opposing counsel will be able to see where you've made changes in your report. So listen respectfully. There are things that seem really clear sometimes to you, but are actually not that clear to an outside reader. Sometimes you use terms of phrase that have a meaning that you didn't intend them to mean. To mean. But do be very cautious about being asked to stretch the evidence further than you want to go or put in a conclusion that's not really yours or edit out something that you think is, or they think is unfavorable, that you think is important. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, if, if people ask me to put in a little bit more, um, <laughs> sometimes we're pretty close to the deadline and I'm not crazy about that, but, but putting in, it may mean that they can use, uh, uh, 
a set of documents or a document that might not be critical to your report, but which they want to, to use and, uh, and, or cover um, an event <clears throat> that they want to refer to later, later on. And that I don't have as much problem with. Uh, taking things out is, mm, that's a little more challenging usually. Why do you want to take something out? That's you have to really believe in it, I guess, and, and uh, have to be careful. Um, the um, the the words that no expert witness ever likes to hear in in the words of your legal team are, "Couldn't you just say?" And I mean, I don't know any expert witness who hasn't heard those words, couldn't you just say, couldn't you just say, well, uh, you know, think about it very carefully, I guess would be my view of it. You can make revisions later. It's always better, of course, to come up with the perfect report the first time. But there's, uh, if you look at even the the best edited <clears throat> published texts, there are mistakes in the footnotes. <laughs> so you are probably going to find a few mistakes when you go back and uh, look at it again. You may even, for example, see that you've made an error in uh, transcribing a quote. Or if you read a document again, you know, you may think oh, that's not really what it says. And I think it's better to make these changes before you get into the courtroom rather than waiting for them to be discovered. It's always better to do that, even though it's hard to sometimes admit that you have to make the changes. Um, so make a list of every one of the changes that you propose to make so that opposing counsel has confidence that you've been transparent about everything and that you're not just trying to slip in something under the door. And this also extends to your life inside the courtroom. If you see you've made a mistake, if you're presented with a logical argument or additional documents or whatever in the courtroom, you see that you've, you've either made a mistake in the report or that the evidence doesn't support a conclusion, just say so. Be quick, be graceful. Again, judges appreciate experts who are willing to do that. They do not like experts who can't admit error. And uh, it has resulted in some fairly ugly decisions <laughs> for certain experts who just, who just could not say that they might be mistaken. This is really going to, um, knowing that your reports are going to be so closely read and that you are going to be cross-examined in open court is really going to clarify your reading of evidence and your interpretations. It's, it's a very good discipline, actually. Uh, and just remember, if you're trying to decide what to do, that you're the only person in the witness box. You are going to be the only one who is going to be answering questions. Your credibility is on the line. If you don't have credibility, you can have all the skills and you know, experience in the world and uh, your opinion will still not be given the value that it should have. So just defend your credibility at all costs. It's the most important, uh, most important asset you have as an expert. All right, well, I'm gonna say thank you very much to Gwyneth Jones for uh, that uh, brilliant, uh, really insightful um, uh, workshop. And uh, we hope to all see you here uh, soon for the next uh, CHA Digital uh, uh, Workshop and Roundtable. Gwyneth, thank you very much. And thank you very much. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde who came out today.